hey, 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 Andres, Andres, come, 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 come on, come on, over here, look, look, look at this, come on, this look way? over here, this way, this way, yeah, come on, okay. come, follow me through this way. Oh. Ever been around here? This is this is new back here. Look. No. Okay. Where are Wait we? a second. This is really expi- Wait, look, 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 look. See this door here? Okay. I do. Just take a deep breath. I'm going to open this door and holy. check it out. Holy, holy what? I don't know what to say. Holy moly. I, it's, I, I, there's this big empty room back here. Yeah. And there uh, was a big stack of empty soda cans and old popcorn boxes. Yeah. So I have built... The uh, the two real cinema club memorial lecture theatre. <laughs> and check the, check this out. Wait a second. Let me let me come uh, here and welcome. Oh, check wow. it out, eh? Yeah. Oh, not bad. So I've built this to commemorate a hundred episodes. Now all we need to do is think of something to talk about. <coughs> I, well, I just feel like we've had a hundred episodes and you've been coughing for twenty five of them. <laughs> yes. Well, I should go and see a doctor. Do you know any? <laughs> Yes, but he's far away from me, but very close to you. Uh, so welcome to episode 100 yeah. uh, of the Two Real Cinema Club here at the Memorial Popcorn Counter Lecture Theatre, uh, where we will be delivering a short lecture, uh, <laughs> which we have entitled, What Have We Learned? Yeah. Uh, after 100 episodes of a podcast. Or to quote George W. Bush, who's an yeah. influential thinker for our podcast, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. as he apparently once said, is our children learning? <laughs> um, so, uh, so we have each uh, come up with five lessons uh, that we have garnered from watching. Uh, well, I was going to say a hundred films, but it's yeah. well over a hundred films. Once you factor in all the popcorn counters, oh yeah, and you factor in um, all the other also playing at this theatre. Yep. Uh, so uh, from hundreds of films that we yeah. have watched over the last two years, for sure, have we learned anything? Yes, definitely, definitely. I, I feel 100, so I should have learned something in these episodes. Yeah, I've learned a lot from you, so I'm interested in hearing what you think you've learned. And then anything you've learned from me will be bad. But <laughs> well, um, well, uh, we drew straws, and I threw away the straws and insisted yeah. that I go first. So yeah. I'm going to go first. That's good. That's good. Um, standing at this lectern, this is quite nice, actually. Mm-hmm. This lectern, this is good. Um, so uh, out of the 10 lessons, my first one is simply, I've entitled it, Silence triumphs, um, which, is, which is, I think, yeah. something that we always knew. Yeah. But uh, how can I begin a podcast where I'm going to gab on for hours by saying mm. that silence is better than anything else? Um, so I think we always, uh, but I like the, the, the films that we've seen at the Two Real Cinema Club. I think they've just cemented this notion for me, which is that a film is a story yeah. told using moving pictures. Yeah. You know, and the best storytelling doesn't really involve words so i'm thinking of things like so when we watched close um yeah uh, which is the kind of the tragedy about the two teenage boys and you know the most um effective storytelling in that film is just the image of the broken door yeah or even kind of maverick which was our film of the year uh in 22 yeah you know that is pure action cinema of the finest kind you could watch that film dubbed into a language that you didn't speak and still understand pretty much everything that was going on because they're turning the story with pictures or rafifi oh. you know, which is like the uh, film of this kind and the first film that, the first old film that we did for the podcast that's right um, i wrote down a few other examples like um uh, the good sequences in Napoleon, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, the, you know, didn't have words in them. Um, Three Days of the Condor, you know, like, well, the most exciting s- scenes in that film generally involve creeping around quietly, you know, yeah. not speaking. Once upon a time in the West, such a revelation for me, Oof. you know, of, and that film is largely a silent film for yeah. a lot of its duration. Um, whereas like the, uh, the opposite, I was trying to think of a film, which like, which proves this rule by doing the opposite. And the film I came up with was mission impossible colon dead reckoning yeah. where, you know, in that film, you know, that's supposed to be an action film and it has scenes where there are people pretty much literally queuing up, taking turns to spell out the story in yeah. long, complicated sentences, <laughs> yeah. one after another. Um, uh, so I, I think this has just cemented this lesson in my mind. For God's sake, if you could tell the story without words, please, please do. Yeah, it's a visual medium, and you have to, as a writer, you have to write pictures, which is sounds kind of odd, but that's exactly what you have to do. You have to um, write what you're going to see on screen. 
And, you know, it does annoy me when I talk to people about screenwriting and they just presume that the screenwriter writes the dialogue. And I have to say, uh, and actually, you know, dialogue is part of what we write, yeah, but it's yeah. just like it's, it's the last 10% that you sprinkle on the top. Yeah. You know, the icing is not the cake. Um, my number one lesson, I think, is it sort of reminds me of the premise when we started thinking about and talking about doing the podcast is that um, most films are crap. <laughs> um, we both came to this as, I think, somewhat pessimistic curmudgeons and uh, just thought that uh, we didn't like most films. And, you know, honestly, it, it if you like 10% of what you see, that's actually pretty good. So I, I'm that's kind of optimistic. That's a not bad ratio. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think so often we found that the older films have been better, um, which is maybe a trend that we are just old complaining misanthropes and that's what we think <laughs> about the world. But um, I really do feel like um, um, most of them have been uh, disappointing, um, but a lot of the older films have den- generally given us some sort of foothold to understand why some of the newer films aren't so good. But um, I, st- I still live by that, that, you know, if I, if I like 10 or 15% of the films that I see, that's probably about right. And you just have to sit through a lot of crap in order to find this, <laughs> the real gems, I think. So I think doing the podcast has really uh, distilled that notion for me. And uh, that's the way I look at uh so many films anyway. So, uh, yep, most films are crap. <laughs> this, this, the, the podcast has forced me to sit and watch films that I wouldn't have otherwise watched. Exactly. You know, and sometimes yeah. that has been a joyous experience, and I yep. feel like I've discovered some you know great gems that I never would have uh, come across. Yeah. But also sometimes it's been you know, uh, truly dismal. Um, yeah. So so you win some, you lose some. Yes, fair enough. Uh, my next lesson, uh, number three, uh, I think I have learned, uh, and again, this is something which I think we we probably believed before we started the podcast, but it cemented the idea and maybe added some nuance. Um, my 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 notion is that shorter is better. Yeah, and generally shorter is better, yep. except sometimes it's not. So I'm gonna I'm gonna sow okay. a bit of nuance into that. Nice. Obviously, we love shorter films because they take less time to watch. Yeah, um, you know, look at my neighbor Totoro. Mm-hmm. or Strangers on a Train, mm-hmm. or Grizzly Man, or like the original Godzilla, The 39 Steps. They're all films that we watched for the pod, and they're all brisk. I think they all come yeah. in under an hour and a half, and they're yeah. all great. Yep. Um, and you, know, you watch that, you know, those six films in a row, and you kind of think, can't all films please just be this length? Yep. You know, please, you know, our film has got to have a really good reason for going over two hours. Yes, exactly. Um, but... Um, when I had a long, a longer, a more sophisticated look at our list of all the films we realize, we've watched, I did realize that, well, actually, it's not a hard and fast rule. Barry Lyndon, I love that film, but it's blooming long. Top yep. Gun Maverick, I think it's two hours 22, something like that. Yeah. The Holdovers goes over two hours, but Don't it was see. our film of the year. Wow. Um, Jean Dielman, Oof. Um, Great well over two hours. Yeah. Uh, it is the greatest, greatest film of all time. <laughs> I know that we don't necessarily agree with that, but it's think, you know, it's an interesting film, and I'm glad I watched it. I think that so, was three hours, wasn't it? It's over three hours, over now, I think. <laughs> yes. um, so I, I'm going to slightly, yeah. I'm going to spin this rule. I'm going to say I don't think you have to be short to be good. No. But on the flip side, most of the genuine clunkers that we've seen, yeah, have been too long. Yeah. You know, Red Notice. Yeah. Oof. Um, you know, that, was, that was only two hours, but it seemed a lot longer. Oh, yeah. Jurassic World Dominion, oh, Lord. two and a half hours. Ugh. Wakanda Forever, Ooh. two hours, 40 Ooh. minutes. Yep. Avatar oh. Way of Water, three oh. and a quarter hours. Oh. Um, it's brutal. difficult to make a long yeah. film um, that really works. Yeah. Uh, generally, the clunkers are very long. Oppenheimer, yeah. three hours exactly, Ooh, three get, hours and eight seconds, something don't like get me that. Started. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think for me, it's it's tighter is better. It's shorter is better is a good distillation as well. But I think tighter is better, and it's really hard to be tight when you've got the fat of an extra hour or hour plus <laughs> on your film. So I think a lot of those longer films just don't quite deserve the extra time. Um, Once upon a time in the West, really, it seemed to be the right length, even though it's because it's so contemplative and and Leone's holding so many of those shots and letting you just soak in the American West and the the characters that are as big as the American West. So that one didn't seem too long to me, but so many films that are three hours just aren't tight enough to, to warrant that kind of length. 
So yeah, it's controlling the medium, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So yeah, if you could, if you have control, yep. that uh, you know, take your time, sure, uh, and you know, you can pace it appropriately. If you don't have control, just do less. Yeah. Um, two for me, podcasting isn't easy. <laughs> I know that we sound so fluid and so prepared, and this podcast <laughs> feels like it's just a joy and it's just a breeze for us to produce every other week, but. Um, Truthfully, our listeners don't know about the tech issues that we have almost every <laughs> time. They don't know about the fact that we are in completely different time zones and on different continents, and uh, even just arranging a podcast is not always that easy. <laughs> um, and then there, some of the ins and outs of just... Uh, yeah, there have been times when we chose for ourselves two three-hour films to watch and to <laughs> yeah that's on us frankly that, <laughs> that is on us but to watch it and uh note it and then talk about it it takes quite a bit of work i mean i'm not i shouldn't make it seem like i'm laboring super super hard because i'm not but it's not easy especially when they're when all films are crap i'll go back to my first uh, <laughs> rule as well um when you have to you just sort of slumber through a couple of films just to to be coherent and when talking about them later even though you don't want to watch them that's difficult and then uh, yeah i think just a lot of the boy tonight even when we started i had a silly technical issue where i just popped my microphone or my headphones out of place and then i had to go back and restart the computer and so we need a larger production staff so <laughs> i'd say podcasting it isn't easy but if you've got a big crew and some money it's probably a lot easier than this is so what you're saying is we are advertising for six unpaid interns to come and do all of our work for us. <laughs> that would be incredible. Thank you. <laughs> Email your CV too. <laughs> right. Um, uh, number five for me. Um, yeah. So uh, I have been trying to uh, attend not only the Two Real Cinema Club, but the Two Real Book Club. Yeah. And that has taught me uh, that what you should do is either adapt a bad book or a short book. Yeah. So I have read quite a lot of the books That's right. that films were adapted from yep. uh, for the pod. I was trying to remember which ones, The Man Who Fell to Earth, mm -hmm. Babette's Feast, Poor Things, just the other week, yeah, just, The Short yeah. Timers, which became um, uh, that Kubrick film uh, about the Vietnam War, which name I can't remember, All Quiet on the Western Front, Yeah. yeah. Uh, Women Talking, um, Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, Um and you know, with the exception of Barry Lyndon, which I didn't read, uh, yeah. these books, they're all short. Yeah. My advice to anyone listening to the podcast, if you want to write a book that will then end up being published with a now a major motion picture sticker on the cover. Yeah. My advice to you is write a short book. Yeah. Um, people in the film business just don't like to read. Yeah. Um, so if you're going to sell a book, sell a short book, write yeah. a short book. Um, plus, you know, the nuance and complexity of long books don't really translate to the screen Not at all. Uh, when you want to get get through it in two hours. So keep it short. Yeah. Keep it short or keep it bad so people don't feel uh, uh, like they can't throw away many, many pages. I, I think I could write short and bad. That's my <laughs> wheelhouse right there. And it kind of, kind of like uh, dispels my first one about podcasting isn't easy, but writing short, bad books should be easy. Maybe I... we got it. we got to give that a go. How hard can it be? Yeah, right? It's wild to me that a lot of people write books knowing that they what they really want to do is make a film. It seems like a, a massive detour, but um, I think you're right. And I think uh, I wanted to just check you on, was it Full Metal Jacket that was the... Full Metal Jacket, okay, okay, thank okay. you. Uh, with the magic of digital editing, I'll just trim that back in and make myself look not quite so stupid later. Um, my number is six, I guess, here. Um, and this one's sort of uh, two-pronged. It's uh, people like eye candy, and then you oh. can't be too subtle. And I think these two are related in the sense that... Um, uh, I'm going to name some names here right now. Oppenheimer. <laughs> uh, we, I think, I want to commend us at the Two Real Cinema Club because we stood up to power and we said, no, your film is <laughs> crap. Everyone else is liking it. Everyone else is giving it great reviews. reviews. It's just had a huge number of uh, awards nominated for it. Um, and people like that just because there are a lot of big, beautiful pictures on screen or impressive pictures on screen, but they overlook the fact that the story is absolutely rubbish. Um, <laughs> so I think it sort of goes back to your your number one about, you know, make sure it's silent, make sure you're putting pictures on screen, but don't just put meaningless pictures on screen. I think that's uh, the rub that I take away from there. And then ah. um, 
can't be too subtle. It's more like we've seen a couple of films that are just really, there's not enough story there. It's just some sort of personal experience that's put on stage, on, on screen or, uh, or just something that's under told, I guess, uh, past lives comes to mind. And I, again, this yeah. is a film that's been really well reviewed and received here. And I just don't think it's that strong. And I think it's just, it's too subtle. Uh, Jean Dillemon, honestly, as great as it is, that's super subtle. Um, <laughs> the payoff is kind of huge, ultimately. You've, you've waited a long time to get there, but that's really too subtle. So I think there's this fine line between just putting eye candy on screen, um, but at least putting a story on screen. And I think um, uh, those two films are kind of um, illustrative of both those ideas just in this last year and just in this one award season. So... That's my number six. I think, yeah, we <clears throat> we buy our tickets at the movie house to um, to see a story and not a tone poem, generally, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Precisely. <coughs> oh, man. The Boy in the Heron's Frog is back. Number ah, seven. Yeah. Um, if you can do it. I, I've, I've written a uh, <coughs> tone poem of my own. I've written oh. good, <coughs> good themes are like good art. Yeah. Colon eternal. Um, I mean, you said Haiku. yourself, you know what? The older films um, are usually better. Yeah. Uh, and you are right. But these days, when I watch films with the family, often I get a bit wary about watching older films because I find films, even from just like 15 years ago, uh, can suddenly be really dodgy when you watch them with a, with a modern eye. Oh yeah, we watch. I watched Groundhog Day with the family yeah. not very long ago, and it does kind of look like Sex Pest Day now instead of Groundhog Day. It's, it, it doesn't, uh, for all the great virtues of that film, it doesn't quite play today. Now that, that is just kind of like a staple of nineties romantic comedies that yeah. the man wouldn't take no for an answer, and he yeah, yeah. hound the woman until she gives in, and that's a, <laughs> it's a terrible <laughs> lesson for contemporary relationships. It is. Um, but I wonder, you know, now I am wary of some of these older films, but um, maybe it's the films that I'm choosing and not necessarily the time that they are from. Because you know, we watched Jean yeah. Dielman. This is a yeah. film that was made in 1975, not not very widely seen now. It's kind of grown in stature, yeah. but it's grown because the themes of that film, yeah. the good themes, are eternal. Mm -hmm. In the same way that when we watched um, Dr. Strangelove, that was made in 1964, wow. but it's still... You know, it's, it tells a contemporary story about international relations, doesn't yeah. it? Yep. It still feels like, you know, it's a proper satire of 2023, 2024. Yeah. Um, West Side Story that we watched just a few weeks ago, you know, it, it looks like its themes have been taken from this evening's news. Yeah. You know, it's still contemporary because these good themes, they last forever. Yep. Um, even like Another Country that we watched a few weeks ago, yeah. you know, it has things to say about privilege and wealth, they, and it's just as meaningful as they were in 1984. Yeah. I mean, All Quiet on the Western Front was made very recently. It was a big hit for Netflix because it still resonates today. It resonates better today than it did 20 years ago. Yeah. And, and, and I've, I've got a long list of examples here, but they're all true. Boys Don't Cry feels more meaningful now than it did in 1999. You know, great art um, is eternal. Um which sadly means that maybe Groundhog Day is not great art. Oh, that's a terrible thing to say. I'm not sure that's the message I want to give. Maybe 90s romantic comedies weren't great art. Well, you've got a great elevator pitch for the sequel, Sex Pest Day. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, man. You've sold your next script. I think in, in this pod alone, well, last week too, you just had another great, you got the, what was it, how, seven ways to kill farm animals or whatever. I mean, <laughs> Seven ways to die on a farm. That's it, die on it's a farm. Sex pest day, yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll get my agent to phone Bill Murray in the morning. I'm sure, oh, yeah. I'm sure he'll go for it. Your career, your career is established. Um, <laughs> number eight. Oh, this is about the the yeah the the the, the mechanics of a, a podcast. Um, and this oh. is a nod to George Orwell. Two reels good. Four reels better. Oh, and that's just to suggest that I think it's been great when we've had uh, some guests on the program. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's been a good year for that because uh, we had the return of Inesh Braga. Um, we had both Michael Primer and Stephen Ray Liedlich. Um Your buddy Earl was on as well when his film Tim came out. So it's been good to have other voices on the program. And I hope yes. we can continue to do that. 
And it's just nice to have, yeah, different voices, um, more mix. There's some more banter and just new insights, too, because I think eh, maybe the listeners are getting a little tired of just the two of us talking. <laughs> hey, impossible. What are you talking about? Yeah. Um, no, they'll never tire of us, and that's why we've got a great uh, audience and a successful podcast. <laughs> but, yeah, I think um, sometimes it's better just to have more voices on the pod. Yeah, more more voices and more representation in general. Yeah, it's a good idea, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, yeah, more voices, good. Yeah. I'll buy that. You're exactly right. That's yeah. that's a theme for the podcast and for life in general. Well, my next one is one that I've learned from you, um, uh, which is something I kind of ne- never really understood until you've kind of spoken about it a few times, and I've gradually recognize the wisdom of this way of mm. thinking about films uh which is you often talk about opening oh. and closing images and yeah. i have come to realize from talking to you a hundred times yeah. about your thoughts about films that the opening and closing images of the film are the keys to unlock the whole story yeah now you've t- you have taught me this I, so um I was going back and thinking about some of the opening images that we've had, even in recent films. So the holdovers, it opens um, with a choir, a whole bunch of people yeah. all singing together. Right. And it, it's like this an image of this togetherness, which it then takes the main characters, the rest of the film to learn about. Yep. Um, Dumb Money, um, if you remember that, opens uh, with a scene set in this vast, empty mansion. And it's about the kind of, like the wealth and the vacuousness. Yeah of you know the life that hoards uh, money and pursues it um and you know the rest of the film then is about how um the the, the characters who enter the stock market you know, with their own reasons you know they don't necessarily make money but what they learn is about sort of togetherness and group action um blackberry i went back and uh, checked what the beginning of that was oh, and that yeah. film opens with arthur c clark talking about the future oh, that, that's great that's a great moment too so, yeah exactly yeah. You kind of think, oh well that kind of encapsulates like the whole film doesn't yeah, it actually this yeah. is about you know the moment when the future arrived and the way that it arrived wasn't you know exactly right and yeah. um, and yet it was a you know a little vision of what was to come yep barbie even you know barbie opens with 2001 basically doesn't it, it that right. opens with a real statement yep you know and whether the rest of the film can live up to that and that's a brave thing to do isn't it quote yeah. from stanley kubrick Oof. in your opening moments but you know they are making a statement there these opening and closing moments are vitally important to yep. understanding the shape of the whole of the rest of the film and i never understood that until i listened to you wow. tell it to me a hundred times in a <laughs> row it takes my brain a hundred exposures before something finally goes in but i'm happy to announce it's gone in now yeah, i get it i get it yeah yeah i think there yeah it's just uh, the bookends of a film it should be it has to open well and close well at least in terms of what the story is that it's trying to convey and you gotta write it, it takes writers to do that Ooh, maybe you'll talk about writers later <laughs> um well i'm glad i've learned something from you too and that would be that you james rizika need a better collaborator <laughs> Nonsense. And I'll borrow from uh, uh, George Orwell once again because uh, his character, the boxer in uh, Animal Farm, says, I will work harder. My (laughs) pledge is that I will work harder um, because James is always reading the books that the films are based on. You're always doing extensive research, and I think that makes the podcast better. Your wealth of knowledge makes it a much better podcast than if there were two of me, if I were talking back and forth to myself, it would be a very bad podcast. So <laughs> I think you make this a better podcast. And that's something that I've definitely learned um, in the last two years. Sometimes I just feel like I'm here crapping it all out week after week. But you are there. You're per- Well, you're coughing it all out week after week. <laughs> coughing so it out, maybe, yes. Yeah. You don't want to be the person who cleans my microphone, put it no. that way. Yeah. <laughs> No, fortunately, it's a very far away from me microphone. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, it's, it, it helps to have good collaborators. And that sort of echoes, I think, also that having guests on as, as often as possible because it just um, it makes, it makes the podcast better. It's uh, it's very sweet of you to offer a better collaborator, but I could not have a better collaborator. Aww. I already have the better collaborator. I, I might read the book, but you understand the films. <laughs> <laughs> That's why, that's why, uh, yeah, yours is the voice that I listen to. Uh, so 10, 10 lessons. I think we've learned a lot uh, yeah. out of doing a podcast. Have you got any lessons in reserve? Uh, any extra little um, uh, extras? Not that I can think of. Um, I, I put two more down. Yeah, which yeah, I, share yours. I, um, 
I had like in, in my back pocket um, in case you reproduce some of mine because you know uh, we <laughs> I'm very good at copying your ideas. But the, so my 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 reserves were. Um, one was that writing is too important to avoid using a writer. Yeah. Or I got, at least and this, that's kind of, that was the idea that I wanted to say. Yeah. And then looking back through the films that we have watched, I started to realise that actually many of the very best ones were written by their directors. Oh. Yeah. And so I didn't have the facts <laughs> to back it up. It was just this kind of, this notion that, oh, yes, yes, writers are vital to, to the yeah. success of a film. But actually, you know what, it turns out. Yeah, that's not true. It'd be, well, it'd be um, interesting to see if those directors were writers first, or they are actually really also very accomplished uh, writers before they uh, were directors, kind of thing. I mean, um, one of the ones which I, I put down, which sort of maybe proves proves my point, the point that I couldn't quite write. Uh, Hitchcock didn't write his scripts. That's, oh, yeah, um, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Rage of the Lost Ark was written by Lawrence Kasdan. You know, what, what a great screenwriter. Yeah. Um, but the other one was uh, Once Upon a Time in the West. That film was such a revelation to me, yeah. written largely by Sergio Donati. Um, mm. But with a story by Dario Argento, that's right. Yeah. And Bernardo Bertolucci, how's yeah. that for wow. a screenwriting? Yeah, team? exactly. Oof. Um, yeah. But sadly, yeah, using a writer isn't always the rule. Um, the, the other, the other um, revelation that I've had, which was my uh, my reserve lesson, which was quite simply that the film business is vile. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, it was our second most listened to episode out of all of the podcasts that we've done. Yeah. It's the episode about Adele Hanel, that's right, the French actor. Um, where all we did was we just read out yeah. her letter of resignation yeah. um, from the film business and then talked about the implications of it. Yeah, um, but you know that is our second most listened to episode um, because yeah, it turns out um, still. Uh, we're still seeing films that ask women to kind of justify their screen time through nudity. Yeah. Uh, or did someone say Oppenheimer? Um, <laughs> you know, we, we watch women talking and, you know, and that film is, you know, broadly a statement about the lives of general, of lives of women in general, but it's, yeah. you know, in the wake of the whole Weinstein thing, it's, it's a direct criticism of the film business in particular. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. I think you could say the same thing about reality as well, which is one of our kind of films of the year. Yeah. Um, the film business is a bloody vile place, isn't it? It is. Um, there are there are there are little diamonds of hope in there, but um, there's an awful lot of male gaze still going on. Yes, um, change is coming. Maybe not maybe, fast enough. Maybe. And here we are, wanting to get more and more involved in that film business, that <laughs> vile business. But we're <laughs> oh going to make God. it better. We're making it better. We'll do our bit. We'll From do the our podcast bit. on up. We should, I also think we should do more podcasts from this beautiful little lecture hall you've got. This is here. magnificent, isn't it? Exactly, <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, sadly, when the film ends, I think they're going to come and sweep it all away. Though, oh, I'm sure they are. we'll have to rebuild it again for the 200th episode. Oh, good. I'll see you back here in two years for episode one. <laughs> right, it's a date. Let's see you in two years. Bring popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, before we sign off, it's yeah. been a pleasure doing these hundred episodes. Uh, I've loved it. I've uh, had great conversations about films. I understand things so much better, and uh, I hope uh, our listeners are are getting something out of it as well. Get to the next one hundred. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, Ooh, oh, I think I think there's still some soda in the bottom of this can. Yeah, mm-hmm. here's a little, <laughs> good for your cough. You need cough. Oh, that was disgusting. Yeah. I shouldn't have drunk that. That was horrible. Mm. That's my eleventh lesson. <laughs> don't drink. Don't drink. Don't drink the stale soda with somebody else's can. <laughs> <laughs>